presentation today will be about the role of quality assurance program in optimizing laboratory cost management. This is an interesting topic. Every now and then we hear about a consolidation, merger, and acquisition. And this is not going to stop anytime soon. Actually, it might accelerate. Many people look at us in the quality assurance department as a cost center. Today, my role is to prove to you that the quality assurance department, it is not a cost center. It is a cost saving center. So let's get started. I divided my presentation into three components. The first part, I'll explain to you the concept of cost of quality. What is poor quality? What is good quality? In the second part of the presentation, I will show you how you can calculate your quality within your lab in terms of sigma metrics in all phases of testing, at the pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic. And in the last part of the presentation, I'll be sharing with you five examples from the National Reference Lab where we were able to optimize quality and cut cost at the same time. So let's get started with the first part. When we charge for a laboratory test, the total charges is divided into three parts. The cost of testing, cost of waste, and profit. Successful lab will work hard on the area of cost of waste, will optimize their operation so that they can improve the bottom line. So the cost of quality is divided into cost of good quality and cost of poor quality. The cost of good quality is further divided into prevention and appraisal costs. The cost of poor quality is divided into internal failure and external failure costs. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So as much as possible, we'd like to focus our time and attention on the left side on preventing prevention activities rather than fighting fires. Every dollar we spend in the left side of the screen in prevention cost and appraisal cost will save us $3 in dealing with root cause analysis and issues. The CLSI definition of prevention costs are the cost of all activities specifically designed to prevent poor quality product or services. And I'll follow in with Dr. Bruce's example about humanized sample. Um, before I get into the hemolysis, I will say that uh, for prevention cost, preventive maintenance is a good prevention cost because we, what we're going to do, we're going to do our daily maintenance, weekly maintenance, monthly maintenance, PPM. By doing so, we're going to ensure that we are releasing high quality results and at the same time, we'll, we lengthen the lifespan of our equipment. Uh, when it comes to appraisal cost, the CLSI definition of appraisal cost are the cost of measuring, evaluating, and auditing the quality of laboratory services to ensure conformance to regulatory accreditation and customer requirements. A good example is accreditation and audit. It will cost us some time and money. However, in the long term, it will help us identify issues proactively before it affects our patient care. Moving on into the cost of poor quality. So the cost of poor quality is divided into internal and external failure costs. Internal failure are those we, we catch inside the laboratory. Example, the sample problems. So if we identify that one of our samples is hemolyzed, then we already incur some costs such as labor costs and material costs. So as much as possible, we would like to have the proper training before we even get into that area. External failure costs, the CLSI definition of external failure, are problem detected outside the laboratory by physicians, nurses, patients, and customers. Example misdiagnosis. So going back to the hemolyzed sample example, if we did not know the sample is hemolyzed, we don't have a delta check, and the doctor acted on it, then there's going to be misdiagnosis, and that can cause patient harm. So just to summarize the last few slides, I would like to use a Swiss cheese model to kind of explain to you when we want to provide good patient care, what are those our lines of defense? The first one is prevention and appraisal. Our second line of defense is internal and external failure. And that will 
conclude the first part of my presentation. The cost of poor quality are tangible. They will cost you customers money and ultimately they can affect the success of your business. Moving into the next part, which is how you can calculate your quality in all phases of testing at the pre-analytic, analytic and post-analytic. I think the best source here is the Six Sigma Quality Design and Control book by Westgard. So at the pre-analytic and post-analytic, Westgard recommended that we measure outcome. So for example, for sample rejection rate, um, if your rejection rate is 0.5%, we need to change this into defect per million opportunity, and then you can calculate your sigma rate. Basically, you can use this table um, to plug in your numbers, so that if you have, for example, 3.4 uh, uh, rejected sample by 6 million, uh, by a million sample collected, then you are at a six sigma and then you have the five sigma, and then there's a four sigma. But I recommend that you use the online calculator because it can tell you exactly your sigma metrics in those areas, in the pre-analytic. For the post-analytic, if we take the critical results example, let's say um, your critical result documentation is 99.9%, .9%, you can still calculate the sigma metric at the post-analytic phase as well. At the analytic phase, uh, the recommendation is to measure your sigma level at the quality control, and I'll explain this toward the end of the presentation. This is a CAD QPROP survey, although it's a little bit dated, but I just show it to you that so you can see, you can see when you have your um, KPIs or your quality indicators, you can translate this, for example, your hematology specimen rejected is 0.38%, Translate it into defected, defect per million opportunity. So you have 3,800 defects per million sample collected. Then you are at the four sigma level. And then all of your quality indicator, you can do the same. And then you can identify the sigma level of your lab at any phase of testing. Why do we need this data? What are we going to do with this data? You can use this data and look into this table to see what is the cost of poor quality. So if your laboratory is uh, performing at the four sigma level, which is most of the accredited lab will be between four and five sigma, that means your quality level is 99.4%. Your defect per million sample is 6,000. Your cost of poor quality is 15 to 25% of your revenues. So our goal is to continue to improve the quality by improving our sigma level so that we, our cost improve and that will add up to our bottom line. This data is also supported by article from the New York Times which said that 30% of healthcare spending is wasted in poorly delivered services. And the cost is not only monetary, actually the cost, uh, it can cost us also patient life. The John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore released a report in 2016 stating that medical errors now became the third leading cause of death in the US, the third leading cause of death due to medical errors. Very alarming. 250 to 400,000 patients die every year due to medical errors. So again, the cost of poor quality is not only monetary, it costs human life. The same report indicated that the laboratory error is 0.33%, and if you plug this into an online sigma calculator, that will reflect into 4.2 sigma. So now we completed the second part of the presentation. Let's move into the last part, which is what do we need to do when we go back to our work next week to implement, to improve the quality of our lab services? Quality is never an accident. It is always the result of intelligent effort. So I'll be sharing with you some of the intelligent effort that we have done within our network. Hopefully you can adapt some of those ideas in your laboratory. I'll be sharing with you our audits, SOB standardization and efficiencies, test process validation techniques and optimization, process management, quality control. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes in each one of those. So when it comes to accreditation, um, we have a number of accreditation. Last year, we have 13 inspections, anywhere from CAB, ISO, JCI. 
this year we have 16 uh, scheduled in inspection and we have been successful. And I will share with you four strategies that we have done within our network to make sure that our re-inspection process is a seamless process. So the first strategy that we have done is we train the frontline staff on the accreditation standard. So the QA department will sit one-on-one -on -one with all the frontline staff who are handling accreditation checklist to make sure that they do understand the standard and they know what elements of compliance that we have in the standard to meet the, to, to meet the requirement and our record as well. And that's a win-win strategy, win for the staff, because the longer they stay with us, the more they learn, the more they broaden their quality assurance horizon. And win for us, because we have a status of continuous survey readiness at any time we are ready for an inspection. And it also helps with the staff retention. Second strategy, we take the self-inspection seriously or responsibly. So we have 10 labs. So lab E will do inspection for lab B, lab B will inspect lab C and so on. And usually in the self-inspection, we find many more deficiencies than what you find in the real CAP inspection. We have a template ready to be rolled out with new departments. Whenever we add a new department, for example, HLA, flow cytometry, TB, we have a template ready to be rolled out to ensure that this new department is in compliance with our quality management system and in compliance with the accreditation standard. Also, when we take over a new lab, usually within one year we have taken over, we, we will uh, implement a solid quality management system so that lab can be accredited within one year. And last but not least, we are conducting um, or adapting a continuous survey readiness strategy. So we have extensive checklist, anywhere from 60 to 100 line items, um, which include proficiency testing review, QC review, calibration. Our quality assurance department every month go to all the 10 labs and do an audit. And usually we share the audit score with the supervisor and the management team. And that helps us to be in compliance with the highest quality and accreditation requirement, not only two weeks before the CAP inspection, but throughout the year. Because patient is very important to us, we want to make sure that we produce high quality results throughout the year. These are our major activity in the QA department. You can see we are very busy with inspections. Um, these are CAP inspection, ISO inspection, um, self inspection, and other projects. I just want to share with you something that we have done that you also can adapt your laboratory to improve quality and cost at the same time. We work with the way accreditation to conduct a system inspection. So we have seven laboratory get inspected all together. Instead of having an inspection every couple of months, which will keep us busy with preparation, logistics, and so on, all the labs were inspected together. We have done the same with the CAP. In 2016, we used to inspect two labs together. 2017, we, more, we moved more into inspecting four labs together at the same time. There's a lot of benefits to system inspections. The organization collectively can work together to prepare for the inspection. They promote teamwork. And when you have a citation, instead of addressing the citation in this lab, and then two months later you address it in another lab, you can address it at the system level, at the QMS level. And there's many more benefits to system uh, accreditation. So I encourage you if you have, and I know that many of you are working in a network of lab anywhere from five to 10 laboratories, system inspection is very beneficial. Um, SOB standardization is another thing that I advise. If I look into the number of applicable standards to our laboratory, since we have 10 labs and it has different activity menu, therefore the CAP customized checklist can range anywhere from, let's say, uh, 400 to 1,000. In addition to that, we have a number of ISO standards, and in addition to that 10 standard, we have to be in compliance with 8,000 standard if we have different QMS, if we have different SOP. So the operation team, of course, work on standardization across the board in terms of instrument. The LIS have short-term, long-term plan in terms of LIS standardization. But in the quality assurance team, we work hard to standardize the SOB across the board. So from over 1,400 SOB, we were able to consolidate our SOBs to 800 because originally we have a number of SOB applied to every single lab 
your QA SOV doesn't have to be different in every lab. You can have one set of SOV applicable to lab A, B, C, and D, and so on. The same with an instrument or technical SOV. If you have the same in instrument, the same allies in four different labs, there is no need for us to have four different sets of SOVs. One SOV will do it uh, for you. So the project of SOV it took us the entire year of 2017. We started with the routine SOV for most of our labs, and then the second part of the year we worked in our anatomic pathology SOV and our molecular and microbiology SOV. So it's a very extensive review in which we reviewed our SOP against the patient report to make sure that the unit of measurement, the reference range in the patient report match the SOP, the calibration frequency. We look into the maintenance of the analyzer to make sure that what is recommended by the manufacturer is what is written in the SOP. The technical um, team also reviewed the SOP for, um, to make sure that it's updated. The scientific team reviewed the clinical significance and so on. So it was a very extensive SOV, almost an FTE worked on it the entire year, along with operation and technical team. But it's a project worth taking because that proactively can address and mitigate any risk to your laboratory. Method validation. I know that since many of you have been recently accredited, some of you, um, the items on the left side of the screen have been addressed by most of your laboratory your accuracy, your precision, your AMR, reference ranges, and so on. But as your quality management system gets developed, gets solid, you will systematically address the items in the right side. So we created a form to address all those items in the right side. So whenever we want to go live with a new test, we want to make sure that the proficiency testing have been ordered by the college, from the College of American Pathologists. Our calibration, verification, and linearity material are ordered. Our SOB for that new test have been uploaded and approved by our medical director who is sitting here in the front seat. The IT department did the interface validation for the new test. Uh, patient report format have been printed out, reviewed, and approved by the medical director, and so on. Even the CAP activity menu, because this is one of the most cited deficiencies in the College of American Pathologists in inspection. We want to make sure that uh, we update the CAP activity menu. Uh, so that everything will be installed in the customized checklist as well. We want to make sure that we uh, also add this to our next future ISO inspection with the methodology as well, and so on. So we want to make sure that, I think, as you develop, your QMS will be so solid to address almost everything related to uh, test method validation. And I just have to remind you, if I ask you, how long do we need to retain our test method validation file for? It is for the lifetime of the equipment, and two years thereafter. So if the average lifetime of your equipment is eight years, that's mean you're gonna keep it for 10 years. That's mean if you're gonna have ISO inspection every year and surveillance visit and so on, you're gonna be inspected 10 times in that same folder. This same folder will be seen by five teams of cabin inspectors. So you wanna make sure that for that test message validation file, you really dot your I's and cross your T's. You wanna make sure that you have done a good job because this document needs to speak for itself. In terms of process management, of course, um, total lab automation, if you have enough volume, is encouraged. So um, the operation team, I know in a different presentation, will talk more about total lab automation, but it helps you with identifying your hemolysis, icteric, lipemia. It will check the volume before the sample start to run. So if that, the test that ordered, um, you don't have enough volume, it will alert you so that you can address this. Um, and it helped us a lot with the, our uh, pre-analytical failures. All, all of us knows that most of the error occurred at the pre-analytic phase. At the post-analytic phase in our laboratory, the QA department, actually Lena, who's sitting here in the front seat, it took her a year and a half to work on an outstanding project. It's called the auto-verification. If the majority of our results are normal, there is no need for our technologists to look at it. A system can automatically verify it. So that's why we have to go into our LIS. We extracted a lot of data. Uh, we look into the normal ranges. We shared the data with our scientific team. They approved it. And now the majority of our results are automatically verified. It's a time worth spending. It took her a year and a half. But the technologists now are very happy because they're going to be focused more in the abnormal, in the critical results that the, that rather than focusing in the normal results. And when the AACC surveyed a number of laboratories why they are not implementing auto-verification, 
They said they just don't have time. I really encourage you to have time to work on it because it's worth it in terms of efficiencies and in terms of improving quality. The last part I want to talk about quickly is quality control. Many people don't think about quality control when it comes to cost management and quality improvement. So um, I know that there's a lot of changes have happened in the area of quality control in the last five years. I, since, I think since CLIA 88, the area of quality control was very boring. There's no changes, maybe with the exception of the equivalent quality control in 2003. But what sparked the change? It was CLSI EP23 in 2011, and I have to put a disclaimer, during that time I used to work for CLSI, but not on the standard section, I was working on the Global Health Partnership. I think that document makes the people think about the frequency of QC, because that document tells the laboratory professionals that you need to look into risk assessment to decide on the frequency of running quality control. A couple of years later, this was endorsed by the CMS, by the US government in 2013. A couple of years later, the CAB made this mandatory into IQCB, Individualized Quality Control Plan. And basically by doing so, you can decrease the frequency of running quality control to less than once a day. And this has been implemented in many labs around the world in the area of microbiology, molecular biology, and so on. So on one side, CAB tells you you can do the QC less frequently than one, once a day. On the other side, we look at the ISO standard, which tells us we need to define the quality requirement and we want to make sure we meet it. And we look at that 10, which is uh, the other document with the ISO standard. It tells us that if you perform more than 75 samples in the chemistry department per day, you need to do two levels twice. So I advise you to look at the big picture, make sure that you are in compliance with CAP, ISO, and the local requirement. I'll explain to you more in a minute. So what we have done, we have uh, our team from supervisors, techs, and so on, attended a three days workshop in quality control and uh, Six Sigma. And that helped us, of course, improve our QC practices. Um, when you go back to your lab, one of the areas that you can consider when it comes to cost optimization and improving quality is looking to what waste card rules that you apply in your lab. Many LIS coordinator will just tick everything the one to S, the 10X, the more the merrier, right? This is not the right tool. Think, you wanna make sure you apply the right West Guard rules because if you apply everything, then your rejection rate will be very high. So maybe you wanna apply the 2 to S, 1 3 S, R 4 S only. If your, text, if your test is at a lower segment, then you need to apply more West Guard rules. And I encourage you to read, of course, the West Guard, the latest revolution of his rules, so that you can know what rule you need to apply to what quality level. Um, Westgard last year did a nice study in which he surveyed more than 600 laboratories and he found that more than 55% of the laboratories are still using the 1-2-S rule. Again, that's a lot of cost because you can have a lot of false rejection that is not necessary. So this is an outdated rule that was used long time ago before the use of software, before, before the use of LIS. Now we have LIS, which is smart enough to look into the other run, smart enough to look into the previous day. Another document that I want to bring to your attention that can help you with efficiencies is CLSIC 24, 2016. So we all know that if I ask you, how do you calculate your QC in your laboratory, you're gonna tell me, well, I use 20 data points over 20 days or 20 data points over 10 days. Well, this is now different. The CLSI gave us the stamp of approval to change this practice. So nowadays, you can only, you can, you only need 10 measurements to calculate your mean, rather than 20. And that's approved now by CLSI in the guideline. And then later you can adjust your mean as you have more data. The biggest change in the area of SD calculation. Historically, when you run 20 data points, you will calculate your SD, and it's usually very tight. And you will have a very high rejection rate. Well, now, according to the same document from CLSI, to calculate the standard deviation, you need the new mean multiplied by the historical CV divided by 100. By doing so, your new SD will be a little bit wider. So if you look at the manufacturer range, is that white? If you do the 20 data point, is that tight? The new way is gonna be like reasonable. 
So your rejection rate will be much lower than the rejection rate that you would have used using the old way of calculating the SD. So I encourage you to also consider using this because that will decrease the number of your rejection rate. So that will decrease your cost as well. Last, I'm going to talk about just the, the new way of calculating the Six Sigma in your analytes. So uh, Westgard recommend that for the Sigma level, we need to um, have the allowable error, and those are the source of allowable error, clear, uh, recus, and so on. It depends you want to go wide or you want to go tight, so all of those, and that what we use as well in our lab. The bias, we use the CVL. You can use the PT and then the precision, and then you can calculate the Sigma level for all of your analytes. What are you going to do with that level? If your analyte, let's say your sodium is at a half a six sigma or higher, you only need to apply the one three as rule. You need, don't need to apply the rest of them. If your, let's say, potassium is at a five sigma using the previous formula, then you need to apply the one three as a two two s or four s. And as the sigma level of your analyte goes down, you're going to need to apply more and more West guard rule. As a matter of fact, you need to even increase the frequency of running quality control. So that helps us with efficiency because you're going to decrease rejection rate and also you're going to focus on the low sigma level analytes because if you have an analyte at a three sigma or two sigma, you should not be happy with that. Most of your analyte, 90% of your analyte will be at four, four sigma and higher. But those are the lower sigma. What, what you can do, you need to really review the package, manufacturer package, you need to review the reconstitution, uh, you need to even consider changing the platform if you are not happy with the performance. Okay. So I encourage you to start working on this. In our lab, we already um, installed the Unity software. We export a lot of data, and our team is working hard to go live with the new system as soon as possible. So this is an area that I encourage you to look into. So now I hope after this quick presentation, I showed you and I proved to you that the quality assurance department role is not only a cost center. It can be changed into a cost-saving center, and I have to leave you with the code that I always leave whenever we finish with any inspection. Quality is a journey. It is not a destination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh,